what you guys are doing is a positive action to try to make this country a better place to live, to provide safety and security for you. The difference is when we were doing it, we didn't do that. And I regret it. And I'm saying it, I'm telling you the story as a way to say congratulations, as a way to say you're doing it better than my generation did. In 1969, the biggest concern most of the kids had was getting drafted and being sent to Vietnam. And to be perfectly honest, most of us thought that was what we wanted to do. We wanted to do it because that's the way we were raised on some levels, not to question, just to do. And in that case, it was before the anti-war movement really hit some of them. And the truth is, you guys know this. I told this story to people that don't know some of High. You know how far it is from the front door to the bus stop. Give or take a couple hundred yards. Between that front door and the bus stop, most of the young men used to literally have fist fights out here in order to determine who was going to beat up the Harvard kid at the bus stop handing out anti-war literature because it was our brothers who were in Vietnam serving and dying and we thought it was disrespectful. I went off to college after I graduated and when I came back one year later, it was no longer kids coming in from outside the city to tell us what to think. It was Somerville kids, Somerville High kids, standing out at that bus stop, sending out that same literature. Things changed. Things changed in a matter of a year from acceptance of the way life was to us being part of the resistance, which at the time we weren't supposed to be. We were supposed to be the kids who just went along. You're way ahead of that. You're way ahead of that, and that's good. No one had to tell you what to do. No one had to tell you what was right. You didn't have to learn it from hard experience. You just knew. That deserves my high regard. In some levels, it's because I feel good about how the city has changed, and the people in the city have become a little bit more open-minded. In some levels, I just think it's great to have a younger generation that understands you don't have to just do what you're told. And sometimes it's good to stand up for what you believe in and not wait to be told by other people. Um, so for me, that's, I just want to say thank you for that. You've made me proud. You've made me proud to be from some of you. You've made me proud to have graduated this school. And you've made me proud that I feel good about your generation. Now, I don't know if we're going to win. I have no idea. But I know that you're doing the right thing. And I know that you're working hard doing it. So I think that's really all I want to say, uh, to be perfectly honest. And I tell you, some of, the, some of the reasons I told you that is to let you know that I'm just you. You know, yeah, I'm in Congress, and yeah, we're fighting it. Uh, it wasn't a plan. And to be perfectly honest, no one ever told me that I was going to be in politics. Nobody ever told me, you know, you should be in politics. Nobody ever told me any of that stuff. It just kind of happened. And now that I'm there, I try to represent people like you, people like your parents. I still live in Somerville, still live on Winter Hill. You know, my kids went to this school. My parents went to this school. I love some of them. I love what it was. I love what it has become. And I love the future that you seem to represent. So with that, I think I'm going to stop and uh, see where you want to go. Let's, I, I know you get enough lectures in life. You don't need another one. So let's have some fun. If you want, I can still sing the, the high school song if you want. I, I'm sure you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. <know. laughs> I can sing you some of the cheers we did at the games, too, that we weren't supposed to. <laughs> anyway, okay. Who's got a question or a comment? Let's go. Let's have some fun. Stand on up. Oh, we do have a microphone. Good, okay. Um, are you the Mike Aparno who's related to Chris Evans? <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> uh, how's it like being related to Captain America? Just, he flies in and flies, yeah, it's, oh, man. He's, he's my nephew. His mother went to this school, too. That's, that's dope. All right. <laughs> and by the way, the acting gene skipped me. <laughs> yeah. I don't sing or dance. Actually, his whole family does. His brother, his sisters, they're all, my, my younger sister, she was the actress in the family, especially when she ratted on me to my parents. <laughs> What else? 
Oh, come on. You have, we can stare at each other for a while, but, you know, that won't be any fun. Now you're disappointing me. There we go. What are some of the issues in our community that are closest to your heart and your interests? Mine? Pretty much everything. Like I said, I've lived here all my life. My parents before me, my kids. There's nothing in this city that doesn't interest me. It's one of the reasons I get involved in politics, to be perfectly honest, is to fight to push those issues at the time. And the, and the issues have changed. The issues used to be you know, terrible playgrounds, a lousy educational system, you know, right across the board. Um, the issues have changed. Right now, um, on the local level, the issues are affordable housing. You know, housing costs in the city are astronomical. Uh, and it's kind of, I have to take some of the blame for that because a lot of the things I tried to do and I have done and others have done along with me is to make the city a better place to live, which made it more attractive for people to move in, which meant they paid more money to to live here, which was good in some levels, but now it's kind of gotten to the point where the people I did it for, you know, working class people, are having a hard time staying here. And that's, it, that's a harder thing to solve. It was actually, in hindsight, easy to make the place better in some ways, but it's harder to make it affordable because you want to keep it, a, it, you can make it affordable by making it a lousy place to live. You know, and to be perfectly honest, that's the, the truth was. Um, my entire, I'm looking at my class, I, I, assume, I don't you know what this is. They still, I have no idea. What, they still have yearbooks anymore? Yeah. They still call it the radiator? Yeah. Oh, okay. I don't know why they called it the radiator. I have no idea. But the truth is, every one of those kids in that book, there's only a handful of them who still live here. The measure of success when I graduated here, I'm not kidding, was how quickly you could move out. We got to get out of here. And we got to get out of here for a thousand different reasons. All the urban myths that you ever heard were all true. And that caused a lot of deflated property values. So it was relatively inexpensive to live here. And a lot of the kids, I mean, I know that, again, society's changed. I'm talking to kids, you know, you're, you're very young, you're not going to remember this. But when I was your age, women who were divorced, almost none of them got alimony, and almost none of them got child support. Divorce was just divorce, you're on your own, you got the kids, the heck with it. So, and that was in a day when divorce wasn't all well accepted. You know, it, was, it was the unusual situation. I can't tell you how many of my friends were from single parent families. Now today that's not unusual, in those days it was. And the women had virtually no support, so they had no choice but to live in places that were very affordable, some of them being one of them. Um, anyway, I, so I answered the question, I'm telling you too much now, but. It's kind of like nostalgia for me to come back, so I, I gotta, you got to give me some rope to rant a little bit. Um, anyway, so for me, if I had to pick one, it would be housing on a local level. On a national level, that's easy. Donald Trump. <laughs> um, you know, and everything he represents. Uh, look, I, it, it's not personal. I've never met the guy, so I don't have a personal opinion on him. But I really don't like what he's doing with this country. I really don't like it. And it's not even just the substantive differences of opinion, gun control. I mean, we can differ on that, and I still respect some people that I disagree on. It's how you do it. And, and the how he has done everything, I hate it. And to be perfectly honest, I wish the hell he had grown up here. He would have learned a little different in a schoolyard. You treat people with respect. You can disagree. You can have your arguments. You treat people with respect, especially people you don't know, and especially people you disagree with. So for me, on a national level, it's, it's the way he represents my country. I, I think that's a real problem. And again, I, I disagree with him on pretty much every substantive issue as well, but that's secondary to me. First and foremost is respect. And then, okay, now let's talk about issues. And he, he's, he's wrong on pretty much everything. But I accept that. I don't accept the disrespect he shows to pretty much every group he can find. And if he hasn't insulted a group that you're in, just wait. He will. <laughs> oh, come on. Um, 
I'm curious, as a legislator, how you feel about pork. <laughs> I'm all for it, if it's for me. <laughs> I mean, pork is a, is a term that's defined, it's, it's a, not an objective term, it's a subjective term. Um, in the sense that my def your definition of pork is my definition of reality and necessary. I'll give you an example. If you come from Florida, you may not understand the need to have tax dollars spent to help 80-year-old women heat their house in February. That's pork. What do you need that for? If you come from New England, you better have some understanding of what that means. And let me flip that around. If you come from New England, you may not understand what it means to get that same 80-year-old woman air conditioning in Florida in August. So pork is a term that is used by the media because it makes sense, but it doesn't make sense in most cases. Is there pork? Of course there is some. It's not near what the problem is. Um, it's, it's a matter of differences of opinion. For instance, I, when I, we, we're talking, you're talking mostly, this is a result of earmarks, which means I get to say where the money goes. So if I get money, which I have, for the USS Constitution Museum, if you've been to the Constitution, Old Ironsides, you know where it is. Museum right next to it is a great museum if you like history. And it provides, I think, a valuable service. And it's a good economic engine. It employs a lot of people. So if I get money for them to improve the museum, I think that's a good thing. It's an economic good thing. It's a social good thing. It's a cultural good thing. And it draws a lot of people. I think it's good. If you come from Iowa, you may not understand it. But yet, if you're from Iowa, and you get money for the chicken museum, or whatever, I might say, what the hell are you doing with the chicken museum? But guess what? Chickens is big business in Iowa. Now, I don't know if any of you guys travel. When I, my kids were younger, we used to do family travels every once in a while. And we'd travel around the country, because it's you know, too expensive to fly. So we'd do like, long road trips. We went to this place once in. I think it's New Mexico, I can't remember where it is, somewhere in the southwest, a place called Carhenge. Anybody ever hear of that? New Mexico. You ever hear of it? It's a weird place. But it's, it attracted me from New England. It's, it's based on Stonehenge, made out of junk cars. It was just something to do, and we went. And if they got money for that, I would understand it. Now, it sounds stupid to us, until you go there and you realize it's a tourist attraction that creates business and jobs for that region. So it may be pork to me, but not to them. To them, it's jobs. So the answer is, I think it's just fine when I'm getting the money. <laughs> um, I think anything you want is probably pork. Unless you want the same thing I do. So um, given the data breaches that's been happening with Google, Uber, um, Equifax, and recently um, Facebook, do you believe in like, more regulations on our data? Absolutely, yes. I, I am a big privacy guy. Uh, I've been pushing for more privacy for a long time, and that's before the breaches. And, uh, and uh, I tell you, it's because, actually, Facebook is a classic example. I hate the fact that they track everything we do. And then, I don't mind if you tracked it. If I decide to do business with your company online, fine, I kind of had an agreement with you. What are you doing selling my information to her? It's none of her business. I didn't do business with her. I did business with you. Keep the business to yourself. And it really, I really have come to the conclusion this is a generational difference of opinion. My generation is used to having privacy. Your generation seems to have given it up voluntarily. And I don't quite know why, to be perfectly honest. And, and I, I gotta go back, and it's not, just, it's not just corporations that are doing it. And again, if they were giving it away to share it with their brother and sister corporations so they could sell me more shoes, I don't like it, but they're monetizing it, selling it. It's like, that's mine, not yours. If I wanna sell my information, that's my business, none of yours. Number one. Number two, of course, what's your business interest in keeping the information private, securing it? The answer is up until now, most corporations don't have one. 
it's not worth the amount of money to try to stay ahead of the hackers to secure it. So they stole a couple of million people's information. What's it to me? Well, here's the answer. It should be worth something to you in the form of a fine to make it, the fine needs to be big enough to get your attention to require you to do something you should be doing anyway, which is securing the information I voluntarily gave you. So yes, I am much in favor of reasonable, I'm not trying to kill anything, but I do believe in some degree of privacy. I think the Europeans are much ahead of, much further ahead of us on this than we are. And I don't, I don't trust corporate America to do it voluntarily because there's no business reason to do it. And I certainly don't trust my government, of which I am a part. And you're nuts to trust the federal government with your personal information. It's, you know, Yes, you need to trust us to some extent, and yeah, we need to have your social security information, but we don't need to read your emails. We don't need to you know, check where you've been going online. And I say that, I'm also an attorney. If you do something wrong, go to court, present it to an independent, neutral judge, and say, this is why I think you did something wrong, and get a warrant. It's in the Constitution. You need a warrant for reasonable searches and seizures. That's not the way it is anymore. Just the opposite. The federal government, because America has been silent, we have passed laws, I have voted against every one of them, that has allowed the federal government to do just this. And by the way, we just passed a law a few weeks ago that empowered foreign police powers to do it. Personally, I am shocked that America is not really pissed off. I am. So I like the question. I think I answered it. And believe me, I'm not going to stop fighting, though right now, i got to be honest, I feel like I'm fighting alone. In that until, even when there's a breach, people say, oh, what's the big deal, you know. Breaches are accidents that can be, occur can be prevented, or at least minimized. But until we raise fines for the lack, and I mean seriously, you know, not, not a million dollars to a billion dollar corporation. That's just the cost of doing business. But a real serious fine, even sometimes holding people personally accountable for dramatically and intentionally ignoring today's standards on security, then I think it won't stop. And if that's the case, you may as well just post your credit card and all your personal information on your own Facebook page and let the whole world know it. Uh, and I, I don't want to live in a world like that. So you talked about development being one of your own personal issues and people being displaced around the city. And one solution that the city has come up with is a real estate tax, which is a 1% tax on people who are trying to sell their homes. And that money goes into this fund that goes into um, affordable housing. And you as a homeowner in Winter Hill, like you said, how do you feel about your house being taxed 1% if it means going into developing homes that are affordable for people around the community? Excuse me. Um, well, I haven't caught up with the local proposal spe specifically. I believe it's just a tax when you sell the house. Uh, so you don't get hit until you sell the house. I, I think the city already does a fair, I, let me back up. Before I ran for public office, the first community activity I participated in was as a member of the board of directors on the uh, local community development corporation that is responsible for building most of the affordable housing. I'm a strong believer in affordable housing, but I also believe that you can't solve all the problems of the world in one place. Now, what that means to this specific proposal, I don't know. But I, I, I think you've got to be a little careful. The city's already expensive. And it, if, if I sold my house tomorrow, which, by the way, I'm not doing, <laughs> but if I did, 1% is not going to make or break me. It's not going to mean anything. But I'm not paying that. The buyer's going to pay it. You know why? My price just went up 1%. So somebody's going to pay it, which drives housing prices up. And if housing prices go up, rents go up. I own a two-family home because when I bought it, I needed the rent to help me pay the mortgage. And like many or most owner-occupied multiple-family homes, not investor-occupied, owner-occupied homes, 
I almost never raised the rent on my tenants. I, I, raised, I have one unit upstairs. I raise the rent when the tenant leaves and I bring it up to market rate. And then if I get a good tenant, the rent stays, pretty much. Why? I'm not a, it's not a business to me. It's my home. I want a good tenant more than I want 20 bucks more a month. And most owner-occupied homes feel that way. However, I do need to pay the mortgage. And if I need to pay 1% more for a property, that gets figured into it. So all that being said, it's not an easy answer. It's, it's a very complicated thing. And by the way, if you passed a 100% tax and you collected it, you'd still have affordable housing problems here. And not just in Somerville. And even if you solved all of the problems within Somerville, you still got Cambridge and Medford and Boston and Arlington all having similar problems. That being the case, I think people need to look beyond the easy answer sometimes and ask what's, what's a more, what's a broader answer to this question? The gun issue you're working on. Massachusetts has pretty good gun laws and we're probably likely to amend them still a little further. It helps, but everybody here knows I can go to New Hampshire tomorrow and get a bump stock. And go ahead and try to find a way to stop me coming back from New Hampshire. What are you gonna do, put police along the road? So it's, it doesn't mean you don't do it, it just means you do what you can, but then you know you gotta push that solution out beyond the easy answer. It's the same thing with housing prices too. There's no, I've been, used, I've been doing a affordable housing issue all my life and there's no one way. And every time you push here, something pops up over there and you gotta find a way to balance it. I'll give you an example. The one thing that I, if I had my druthers, if I could be the emperor of the world in affordable housing, at least in this area, I'd stop, I would have done it years ago. I tried to do it years ago, I couldn't. I'd stop all the conversions of two and three family homes to condos, all of them. Why? I don't hate condos. This place, you know, condos is fine. For the reasons I just told you, two and three family homes used to be, and still are to some extent, but less so, the way into home ownership for working people because you can then have that rent to help you pay the mortgage. It's one of the rungs in the ladder up. You can't, most people can't go from living in, 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 in housing projects to owning a home in Lexington. You gotta go one step at a time. And I think one of those rungs, an important rung for a lot of working class people like me, has now been pulled up. Because when you go to buy that two family home and that three family home in Somerville, my brother owns a three family home on Porter Street. His son lives on the second floor and his other son used to live on the third floor, they just moved out. But now when you do that, I'm no longer competing with other homeowners, I'm now competing against investors who come in and throw cash on the table and usually pay over the asking price, and then what do they do? And they're not doing anything wrong, they're just doing what they, what they do. They rip out the, granite, you know, the kitchens and put the granite tops in and you know, charge three, $4,000 a month for, for rent. When if I had bought it, I couldn't have done that and the rent would have been 1500 you know, whatever the number is. And anyway, so for me, I, I think there are lots of ways, sometimes more difficult than the easy thing, just saying raise taxes, but I think more effective if you really want to get to home ownership and you really want to get to affordable housing issues. I'm letting him control the answers, not me. Hi. Um, to point on Andrea's point, I think currently it's 2% if you sell it within the first five years of buying it, 1% within the first 10, and then nothing after 10 years. So I think it's more meant to prevent people from coming in, Specul buying up, yeah, specula it's not speculators coming in, buying these two, three family homes, making them into condos and then selling them or renting them for exorbitant prices. If you come in and you turn into a condo, does that, does that, I, I'll, I'll read it between now and the time it comes Yeah, out. it's, it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah, you, that's what I was saying. If you if you own your house as you, you see, you've lived here all your life, you own your house, it wouldn't apply to you if you decided to sell it. But yeah, it's to prevent speculation and prevent okay. people from coming in. I get it. Yeah. I'll have to, I, then I'll, I, haven't, I didn't know that. I'll have to think that one through how I feel about it. Okay. Thank you. Learn something every day. Uh, this is kind of a separate topic, but um, like positive um, <coughs> with people you starkly disagree with, like fellow Congress people. How do I how do I maintain a positive? Yeah. <laughs> You don't know me too well. <laughs> <laughs> I like um, definitely have seen some videos of you being like 
Yeah. Very passionate. So I just wanted to well, I'm passionate, all right. <laughs> I, am, I am passionate, but it's kind of funny. I, obviously, I have a lot of friends that give me advice all the time. And I just, I just went through something the other day, and people were giving me positive commentaries, critiques of some of the things I had been doing. And they started the conversation out with, take a breath, Mike, and get the Somerville chip off your shoulder for just five minutes. <laughs> and I tell you that again, and I know the city's changed, but I do have this humongous chip on my shoulder. I do. And it really boils down to, as I said, as I tried to explain the way I grew up, every, and I told you the numbers in high school, those numbers were reflective of life outside the high school. They're not just numbers. It was, this city at the time, and for a long time, every kid here was expected to perform below any normal expectations. When I applied to college, my guidance counselor laughed at me. Said, don't waste your time applying to that school, you'll never get in. It's like, why? It's like, because you're from someone. I, my chip basically told them off, and I applied, and I got in. And it was, and it's not. Ju it wasn't just that. Women, my wife. I bet I just asked. Joe Torello is still teaching. <laughs> my, I met my wife in Joe Torello's chemistry class. <laughs> I lit her Bunsen burner, <laughs> which is actually true. <laughs> which is true. Anyway. Uh, but women in those days, <laughs> women were, they were, nobody told you, but you were, no woman that I know of graduated this high school in those days thinking they had any opportunities to do anything other nurse, teacher, secretary. Nurse, teacher, secretary. That was it. And nobody ever said, my wife is now a CPA. She went to school to be a teacher. And when we were together, I finally said, well, you don't want to really be a teacher. You don't like kids that much. <laughs> she was going to teach little kids. And I said, well, go to school. I'll go to law school. You go to business school. And so she became a CPA. And the whole city was considered that. So I do have a big chip on my shoulder because I, I hate everything I do is based on trying to level that playing field. There are no throwaway kids. They're just a no throwaway kids. There's no throwaway people. It doesn't mean you're all going to be brain surgeons and billionaires and famous actors and all that stuff. It just means you should have that opportunity to do it without anybody telling you you can't. Based on your own abilities and some luck. I mean, life is full of luck and nothing you can do about that. And that drives me. The passion sometimes turns to anger, to be perfectly honest. But every morning when I wake up, I realize life can be better. And I have seen it. And if life can be better, not just for me, but for uh, lots of people, you get a choice. And you're just going to sit there and moan about it and complain? Go ahead. Get out of my way. I'm going to do what I can to fix it. Now, that keeps me positive because I see results. But I also am realistic about them. I don't think results happen like that. I am less angry today than I was when I was your age, if you want the truth. Because I understand things take time sometimes. But I also know that if you stick to it, you can change it. You can make, a, you can make the world a better place. And because of that, that's pretty good. I think if you're going to ever go into a public life, a political life, but not just political, I think it's absolutely essential. I, I don't think I could do this if I didn't have a positive attitude, a realistic positive attitude. But po I think every day can be better. I think it can be better tomorrow. I want to be part of making it better. And I don't like being angry all the time. I am, kind of. It's there. The burning's still there. The flame's still there. I try to temper it a little bit. And I'm, it's more fun being pleasant. That doesn't mean that I'm not hard. And it doesn't mean that I'm not angry. It just means focus on the positive. So how do I keep it going? It's just who I am. And because if you let it change, 
than the people you're opposing, the ideas you're opposing, they won. Don't let them win. They ain't getting me down, they're not keeping me down, no matter what. Don't let them do it to you. Hi, sorry, this is a little bit of a change in subject, but I was just wondering about your stance on Common Core standards and state-administered standardized testing. Yeah. Um, I hate standardized testing. Always Amen. have. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> there are standard tests. They're called the SATs and the ACTs. They're already there. I don't mind testing. Life is full of tests. I certainly like the idea of minimum standards. And I'm going to tell you another story. Of the 400 kids, 470 some odd kids who graduated with me, the God's honest truth, not all of them could read. I knew kids who could not read. They had been giving what was a time was called social promotions. All right, why? I need this kid out of my class. Move him on. That's not right. You should not have a high school degree without being able to read. You don't need to do, I, I, I took the uh, MCAS 10, 15 years ago, because I've always hated them. I, I should, I, I, I'm to be clear. I've hated them for the reasons they are used. I appreciate them if they were minimum standards tests. You should not be able to get a high school degree without being able to read. Not so much on you, but that's on your teachers and the system to allow you to get to that point. So yes, minimum standards, you should be able to know how much two plus two is and some other basic stuff. Yes, you should. Beyond that, the SATs will carve it out. That's what'll stratify you, who can be the brain surgeon and who can't. That'll stratify you. I took the, the MCAS years ago, and if you, I don't know if they're still doing it. They put them online after a couple of years. So the one I took was like two or three years old. They put the answers right all into the thing. So I, 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 had, I actually had my staff print it out and white out all the answers for me. And I did fine, but here's a question that was on that test. What is mitochondria? The powerhouse of the cell. <laughs> All right. Now, if you are my doctor or you are a biologist, you really need to know what mitochondria is. You don't need to know that as a politician. You don't need to know that as an attorney or a truck driver or a mechanic. And I'm not saying it's not important, but it's not a basic skill. And it's like, wait a minute, what's that doing on this test? Yes, it's appropriate if you want to take an SA2, are they still doing the level two test the afternoon? You want to take a, a chemistry ke test or a biology test level two? Yeah, that's a fair question and maybe more. But simply to graduate high school? No. So for me, that's my problem. It's not so much the testing, it's how they use them and the fact that the testing has now driven your education. Uh, I'm not interested in a generation of kids who can regurgitate facts to me. You need, you, you need to know some facts. You need to know that two and two is four. I personally think, I think civics should be a much more important aspect of what you get, what you get taught. Well, I'm doing good. <laughs> and I think it's a fair question. What else you need to know? I mean, we can have that debate and things change. I get that. Um, but I think we've kind of lost track. I, I want you to be able to think. And you need to have some facts, but I don't think you get much time. Not that the teachers don't want to do it. I don't think you have much time left to really learn how to use this thing, other than simply spill back the stuff you have to do. So for me, that's my problem. It's not the standardized test per se. If the standardized test really were where they were passed, <coughs> they were passed on the auspices of a minimum standards test. That didn't bother me, conceptually. Again, you should be able to learn to read, write, all basic stuff. That's not what it is. That's not what it is. And I don't like teachers being forced to do it, and I don't like you being forced to receive education all geared towards a test. That's me. And the core curriculum goes to the same thing. The core, I, mean, I do think that there are certain curriculumized items that need to be standardized, but there also needs to be some flexibility. They get any arts and you know, music or anything in the regular day anymore? Probably yes. not, right? Yes. In the regular day? Yes. Good. Okay, I didn't know that. That's good to know. There was a time when you didn't. Uh, I don't know how you forced it into the schedule, but good for you. I got a chip uh, on my, my shoulder, too. Good. <laughs> 
But you know, honestly, there was a time when that wasn't valued. And to be perfectly honest, I personally think that art, art for art's sake is wonderful and that's great. I actually think art helps you, and I mean art, or art in every form, helps you think. It helps you think in a different way. Now, you know, and, and so therefore, I, I kind of, I'm glad it's in the curriculum. I didn't know that. That's good news. Good improvement. Um, I recently read an article, sorry, <laughs> um, about how if the women's movement in the 1970s had focused on um, paid maternity leave rather than abortion, that we'd be much closer to equal pay today. It was their opinion, and I was just wondering if you had any insights on that or any opinion on that. Um, and there's an article I read <laughs> recently about how um, had the movement in the 1970s focused on paid maternity leave for women rather than abortion, we'd be much closer to equal pay for women today. And I'm just wondering if you had any like insights or an opinion on that. I don't know. I don't know. Um, most the movements that I've seen throughout my life, they usually start with something. They're not really that thought out. I mean, the gun issue. You wouldn't have a gun movement today if there wasn't a Parkland. And, and, and the 10 massacres that happened before that. The, the women's issues in the 70s, you have to understand, the 70s were a tough time in the sense that we were still getting over Vietnam. We were still, women's issue was just coming in. Racial issues were very important then. Um, it was the, the typical left-right argument across the country with Richard Nixon and, and others. So it was a tumultuous time that a lot of things were thrown on the table and a lot of things don't stick. And a lot of things, you get them wrong, sometimes along the line. So I, don't, I can't answer the question. I don't, I don't, know, I don't know what was what would have been the right way to do it. I, I do know that a lot of things, very divisive, a lot of people spent a lot of time screaming at each other without talking to each other. And I do know that we, made, we've, we have made a lot of advances, but we got a lot further to go. I'll give you an example. I was, I was, I grew up in that period. I became mayor in 1990, and I was mayor until 1999. And in that time, I gave away paid parental leave before the federal government or the state government required it. Why did I do it? Because I had kids. And I told you, my wife was a CPA. And yet, as two professionals, we couldn't find good opportunities to take care of our kids and to help us raise our kids. And, there was no preschool programs at the time. And it was like, this is crazy. So my wife and I had to look at each other and make a decision whose career was going to take a step back and you know, all that kind of stuff. And it was like, it's not just us. It's a societal issue. And so for, for me, pain parental leave became a very easy answer, to be perfectly honest. And it's not just about kids. It's also you start seeing people as you get older, people taking care of their parents or their grandparents. There's a lot to it. And you get these things more right as you go along and you make mistakes. So, I, yeah, the gun issue. Hell, we, we banned assault weapons and then we unbanned them. You know, so you make mistakes along the way and you gotta go back at it. So I, I can't fairly answer your question what we should have done, um, except there's more work to do and gonna fall on you soon. Not just yet. Who's got it? Why do you think that the gun control issue has got such a reaction that it has now? Correct. Kids are dying. Kind of simple. I was actually, I was actually really disappointed after Sandy Hook, if you want the truth. I really thought that the massacre of babies would really make America wake up. And when that didn't happen, it was stunning me. But let me be real clear. I know you're active on this issue now. You gotta stick to it. And I don't mean just as students, I mean as adults. You're not gonna win everything you want by the time you graduate high school. The issue won't go away. I guarantee you the NRA is counting on America losing interest. That's why they're not standing up pushing back too hard. 
because they know they're going to lose if they do that. So they're just going to sit back and hope that this peters out. It has happened before. I don't know whether it'll happen again. Some of you will stick to it. I'll stick to it. I don't know whether America's attention will stick to it. I just don't know. I do know that without these kinds of actions and these moments, nothing changes. That's unacceptable. I don't think there's any dishonor in having a fight and losing. I think there's terrible dishonor in life to see something that you think is wrong and not fighting to change it. That's the wrong answer. I've lost a lot of battles in my life, but I'm never gonna shy away from a battle that I think is right. This is right, you know it's right, your generation knows it right, and if you don't win it today or tomorrow or next week or next month, you gotta keep at it. And I know that's hard. It's, you're not the first group of young people to have this, the idea that we're right, why don't you change it tomorrow? You're one, it happens to every young group. All I can do is just tell you what the reality is. The reality is I hope to God we have a win. We've had a few little tiny wins and they're good. We need a bigger win, either on a state or a federal level. And whatever it is that we win, I guarantee you it's not gonna be what I want. I guarantee you it's not gonna be what you personally want. If you gotta make a commitment to yourself. Do you think about, about the this? progress being made now or the support that it's being gained for this in any way race Serious related? Up. Do you think that the progress being made with this movement and the support gained is any way race related? And when I say this, I mean that issues faced by marginalized people in our society are never seen as, an, as so prominent and so effective as when not to take away value from the deaths of the students as white suburban kids when they die. I agree. Why I do. do you think that Black Lives <laughs> Matter still you, doesn't matter? You, you're going to have to ask the media that. I, that, that, that I don't know. Do you think I that do agree with you, though. And by the way, let me be real clear. Learn a little history as well. Most movements that you can think of were started by the middle class. Or not started. Were effectuated by the middle class. Starting, not starting with, but one of the most example, biggest example, the American Revolution. It wasn't started by poor people. It was started by relatively upper middle class people. And it spread, and they were putting voice to an argument that others had. Why that is? You get, that's, I, I have to go back to my answer. You have to ask a sociologist why this works. I just, I agree with you. It's an absolute fact, and it is, I do think it's a factor in this case. Here's my other answer to you. Okay, that's one aspect. Take advantage of it. Here it is. You're right. What are we going to do about it? And if the answer is lose focus, my answer is right now we have a chance to maybe, maybe, maybe improve gun laws. Maybe for some wrong reasons, but it's true. Use it. Use it to the best of our ability. Doesn't mean you shouldn't ask the questions. It just means don't lose focus on the issue that you might be able to win on. My thing is, I think that even if gun reform is made, it's never going to reach people living in the margins. It's never going to reach people who deal with it every day. I don't, I don't, I don't agree with you. I think that, with that attitude, you'll never change anything. I think I, it's I don't because agree. things like these are national issues, whereas things faced by people of my skin tone will so always do you be want seen to do about as common Nothing? issues. I'm curious, do you think that it's your job as our representative to make sure that these people have voices? To the best of my ability, yes, I do. And I'm trying to do that. Yes, I do. But I also With think... what? What are you... How are you... Do well, you for instance, on here's the meeting I just had before I, let, before I came here. The meeting... When I was... Actually, I actually thought I was late, but it turns out I wasn't. The meeting I just had was with two women from Roslindale who were trying to find a way to change the laws to solve unsolved murders. Gun violence. They had a good idea. Not my idea. Their idea. We're going to help them push it. Now, was it going to succeed? I don't know. Am I going to try? Yeah, I am. So, and that's just one of them. There's a thousand ways to do this and a thousand ways we do it. But I also like to have wins. And in this particular case, the win we might be able to get 
is on general gun control on some things. Take it, use it, expand it, build on it. If you want to focus on the negative, that's your prerogative. That ain't me. My answer is, I got a positive going on now. Your generation has created that positive. Let's run it as far as we can down the field. And once we get what we can get, move on to the next issue. Thank you for your thoughtful response. Thank you for your thoughtful question. I'll stay here all day. You guys don't really want to go back to school, do you? Got an MCAS test today? <laughs> um, I was just wondering, because we've been talking about this in our AP Gov class a little bit recently, how do you feel about the female representation in Congress? Like, do you feel like females should, like the female representation in Congress should mirror the demographics of our country, or do you think it should just be merit-based? I think the best person should win every election. And I think that women, uh, when they put their name on the ballot, they should win because of the best candidate. Or they're not. Kind of simple. I think equality means you can equally lose as long as you're losing for good reasons. Um, and by the way, let me back up. I'm, I'm, I'm clearly a male. My wife is clearly a female who lived through a lot of the stuff that people are concerned with on discrimination against women. After she graduated uh, business school as a CPA, the first meeting she went to with her new accounting firm, they asked her to go get the coffee. You know, it, and that was a long time ago, and it changes. And my wife's a sum of a girl, too. You can imagine how that conversation went. <laughs> so the, the answer is, I, I, look, if people only vote for people that look like them, you get one heck of a divided country. First of all, women would be in every single office in this land because women outnumber men in every demographic category there is, in every district on the federal, state, and local level. It's just genetics. Why there are more women than men? Ask the biology teacher. I don't know. But it's true. Number one. Number two, you should be voting for the best candidates you can get. Women, people of color, everybody should be judged on who and what they are and the ideas they offer. And not on what they are. I'm not silly enough to think that some people don't vote that way. Of course they do. Some people will vote against a woman. Some people will vote for a woman just because of that single factor. That's not that many of them. There's some, and you're not going to change their mind, either one of them. And they're both wrong to me. The answer is, if you want to run, run. Present yourself as a good candidate, win. And I think the opportunities for women doing that, the level playing field that I started out talking about before, it's not fully level yet, but it's getting more level every day. And that's why there are more women in public life every day. It's not going to change overnight, you know, it's, but it's changed a lot and will continue to change. And for me, I think in Massachusetts it's pretty well changed. Otherwise, if we, and it's not just women, it's also race, it's, it's all kinds of ethnicity. If that's the case, how did Deval Patrick get elected? How did Barack Obama get elected? There's not a majority of African-American males, they get elected because they were the best candidate at the time according to our votes. And that's the way it should be. You know, and Deval Patrick is a good friend of mine, and when he came to see me, I was in office at the time, and I looked at him and I said, How, why are you running? He gave me a great answer. Better answer than I ever gave to anybody. I said, you know what, I'm going to support you. You know why? I said, because you didn't tell me you're running as the black guy. Didn't come up. That's the right answer. He was running for all the right reasons. And he won, that's great. But he didn't govern as a man of color. He governed as a man who did the best job he could do. That's the way it should be. I don't think that I should be judged because I'm a man. I don't think you should be judged because you're a female. It's obvious, great, and there are differences. But I thought it was all about being equal and a level playing field for everybody. If, and again, it's not level. I'm not pretending that it is. That's what it should be. That's what the goal should be. And that's what I try to do every day. And again, I gotta, go, I gotta be honest, I gotta go right back to what I said earlier. It's all about the fact that I was raised here. Because the field was tilted against all of us. All of us. Men, women, people of color, everybody. 
the field was tilted against us. It was an uphill climb for everybody, and it never felt right. To this day, as a successful white man who's supposed to run the world, I can't tell you how uncomfortable I feel when I walk into certain rooms. In my mind, I'm not supposed to be there. In my mind, they find out I'm a Somerville kid, they're gonna kick me out. Now, that's probably not true, and maybe it's you know, my own crazy little upbringing, but it's here, and I hate it. I hate it for me, I hate it on your behalf. My whole life is about trying to level that playing field to give you the shot that you deserve as an individual. That doesn't mean you're gonna succeed, it means you're gonna get a fair shot to be judged on it. So, what do I think about? I think women deserve an equal opportunity to succeed as equal to anyone else. But I feel that way about everybody. I feel that way about, I, I'll give you, I, I guess I gotta stop because your teacher's getting nervous. Oh no, I'm just saying, if you guys want to go to third lunch uh, now, Oh geez, putting me between them and lunch, that's a mistake. <laughs>